I'm Dorothy Chen. I'm a third year dual degree student here at Cornell studying re regional planning and landscape architecture. My concentration is focused on participatory design processes and community engagement, and I'll be your MC today. I'm from Southern California, born in Monterey Park, across the street from Barnes Park, but I spent most of my life in Alhambra. And from what I know, um, James, your organization, Place It, is located in Alhambra. So I'm really excited and I really wanna thank James and John for being here today to speak about engagement practice. And I also really wanna thank Labash for giving me this opportunity to introduce our two speakers today. Now I'm excited to in introduce our two speakers. James Rojas is an urban planner, artist, veteran, community activist, and educator who developed Place It, a hands-on community engagement practice that uses storytelling, objects, and play to help individuals and communities reflect, collaborate, and find their core values based on their memory, sensory experiences, needs, and aspirations. Currently, he and John Camp are writing a book for Island Press on community engagement. John Camp runs the Landscape Urban Design and Engagement Practice Prairie Form, an urban and landscape designer, facilitator, and li licensed landscape contractor. John has developed innovative tools to engage people of all ages and backgrounds in both design and the natural world. His work explores a range of environmentally informed design topics, such as how planting and water, watering techniques can influence the drought tolerance of plants, how plant succession and the role of weeds in urban ecosystems and how design can influence how we as humans perceive um, relative in intentionality in landscapes. He's also an experienced facilitator, trainer, and educator who leads hands-on interactive workshops with James. John frequently translates the findings and outcomes of those workshops into designs for inclusive and livable streets and neighborhoods that leave room for all residents to improvise and help create a more welcoming public realm. So today, James and John will be, will be presenting their talk on playing to plan, engaging people in cities and the natural world through their hands, body, and senses. Welcome, James and John, and thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Let me share our screen and thanks for that introduction. That was great. Great. So this is what we're going to talk about today. Um, engaging everyone in cities in the natural world. Uh, but we do this in somewhat a uh, different way from perhaps other folks where we use have people work with their hands, their body and their senses. Before we started, we wanted to thank Lavash for, for inviting us to this. The work that I mean, we've been doing this work for quite a while and it felt like we were kind of doing it for a very small audience early on. So it's so nice to be, just get to this point where, where we're doing this and there's more of an audience for this and there's interest for this kind of work. So this is a, a good photo to start things off. So this is actually, inspired by my nephew when he was really young he asked both of us like i wonder what it looks like what a city looks like to a worm what does a worm see so then james took that and translated that into this model where you could go underneath the city and actually look at it from from below so and this really sums up i think a lot of what we're going to talk about today which is you know how we engage people not so much with their intellect and their kind of prefrontal cortex brain but how we engage them through their, their senses and their creativity to really, and really spark their creativity in the process. So just to give you guys a sense of what we're gonna talk about, we'll talk about our backgrounds, but so as not to make it super boring, we'll talk about our backgrounds and along the way, talk about what we were observing and those observations were ultimately what have led to the methods that we use for engaging people in cities in the natural world. Then we'll talk about some of those, those methods that we started to develop and are still developing. And um, outcomes. So a lot of people want to know, and, and this is important to us too. Um, how does this? How do these methods actually change what comes out of these processes? Because we don't want these to be gimmicky. At the end of the day, we want them to actually lead to meaningful outcomes and transformations in, in both communities and people. So we'll look at those. 
and the psychology behind what we do. So there is definitely a lot of psychology behind our work. We kind of understood this on an intuitive level when we started developing these methods, but then when we started talking to psychologists for a book, we realized, oh, there's actually like a lot going on here that we had sort of just been intuitively tapping into psychologically. And then we'll look at a few projects so you can get a sense of how we apply this work to, to actual projects. And finally, we'll leave room for a Q&A. So I'll pass it over to James. You can talk a little bit about Placeit. Yeah, so I started uh, Placeit uh, growing up in East LA. I didn't have a lot of toys. So my grandmother gave me a shoebox to play with. After, and I, I built this room and I was really excited to build this room out of objects. And I thought I would do something bigger. So I started building the city around me. So I kind of learned about city planning by using my hands. And you know, because, because I, you know, I was I'm not, you know, so that was a way for me to teach, teach people about urban form. And lucky cities, cities are about objects, shapes, and, and textures. So that's what, that was my way kind of started doing this process. So yeah, and then I worked at Metro. Uh, I went to MIT, worked at Metro for 12 years. And I became this kind of boring bureaucrat. I would work on these east side rail, pro rail projects and we do community outreach. And we, we get like 50 Latinos in the room. And all they would do was, all they do is shake their heads or nod their heads. And I knew they had a lot of ideas about place and space. So I just had I just written my thesis about Latino use of space and all the new ideas they have. So how how do we, how how are we gonna be able to get translate how are we can create a language for Latinos to use that can really highlight their ideas and their thoughts and memories. So that's why I started using objects as a way to do this. Next. Yeah, so at the same time, I opened up a gallery in downtown Los Angeles. And start working with artists, and I was amazed how artists can engage people through their senses, you know, through sculpture, through video, through, you know, through the emotions on thinking about spaces. And I thought, how can we as architects or city planners be like artists and engage people in these really creative ways? So I started collaborating with John. This is, I started, I started, and I started to uh, display my models at, at the gallery, and they were really successful and really popular. And then, to, then into a class at Art Center with Doreen Nelson on, on a, on a you know, design based learning, for, for, you know, how to teach students how to match science and English through model building. And I thought, well, why, why can't we te teach people about city planning through model building? So this is kind of where you got started from. So, so we, we've been, we've been uh, you know, collaborating the past 10 years and we've done, done over a thousand workshops all over the US and abroad. And most of our clients are women and people that are non-planners because, because people that just kind of want to plan their life every day and want to understand who they are in these spaces and how they can understand how to, make, how to articulate what the spaces mean to them and how they can make it better. So most of our clients are non-planners. Yeah, so this is my company, Prairie Form. I started this in 2008. I actually had been working as a city planner and urban designer for the city of Los Angeles. And, um, but I wanted to do something more with the natural world and I had really gotten kind of saturated with working as a planner on the inside. But there were a lot of things that I left with when I, when I left city planning, a lot of observations about community engagement. And I'd say one of the straws that kind of broke the camel's back for me was just being a part of really bad community engagement and ultimately feeling like community engagement didn't have a purpose. So this is um, what would happen at community engagement events. Either people like James was saying they wouldn't talk or they would say the same thing. So one of the things that people would always say is I want more parking. Um, so what we'd say, you know, what, what are the kinds of wonderful things you want in your neighborhood to make your neighborhood a better place? And this is essentially what they'd say. And obviously in this photo, I mean, if you were to think of this as like an entire neighborhood, it would be horrible, but this is what people said they want. Or they said they wanted this, usually both. So they'd say they wanted the parking lot and they also wanted a freeway with no cars on it. Then we put together these really thoughtful presentations. We thought we were educating the audience and you know, setbacks and building heights and street trees and all these things and showing them like the finer grain details of urban environments. And at the end, we asked them what they would want and they would say this, I still want this. And then the other thing too, is that the same kinds of people were coming to these meetings. It's, um, 
and this is really true today as well. It's a demographic that's largely uh, retired, educated, middle class, upper middle class, and they tend to be white. So this is some of the early work that I started doing when I started Prairie Form. So a little backstory is that I wasn't to go back and get a second master's. It ended up turning out to be uh, way too expensive for me. So it was gonna be over $100,000. So I said, fine, I'll just do it on my own. So I did everything. I did the installations, I did the design, I did the, kept the books, all of that. Um, but it was really kind of like a top down approach at that point. I mean, it was kind of involving other people, but it was really very much kind of a one man show. Um, but one thing that I was noticing that was kind of troubling me a little bit is that there was a limited range of people participating in say talks I would give or just the landscape world in general. Um, and this is really the demographic. There's nothing wrong with the people in this picture, but it, it's kind of similar to the demographic of the people who would show up to the community engage or um, to the community meetings that I was doing when I was a, an urban planner. Um, and this just didn't sit well with me. And I also didn't see myself in this group either. So why is this important? Well, I mean, the natural world's incredible, as you guys all know. Um, you know, it's good for our mental health. Uh, we have an innate connection to the natural world and James and I do our model building workshops, which we'll talk a little bit later. Invariably, when people build their favorite childhood memory, almost, I'd say uh, eight times out of 10, it's a memory that has something to do with nature and being outside. So we know we have this natural connection to the natural world, but then when you look at the people involved in it, it's a very limited group of people. We also know based on this photo that, and, and just, knowing in general, you know, we're at this very precarious moment with the planet right now, it's kind of all hands on deck. And a lot of the solutions to these problems do lie in landscape. But then our connection to landscape in the natural world is at an all time low. Part of this is because of, you know, what you see in this photo here, people are on their phones and they're on screens way too much and they're not spending enough time outside. But that's not the, the whole story, I don't think. And, um, you know, part of it is that, from as a landscape designer and an urban designer and from what I've seen, um, we're really not providing a diverse way, a uh, diverse set of ways of entering into and engaging with landscape and landscape design. So one option is to get an expensive degree. So I got my first expensive degree from UCLA, but then I didn't want to spend more money to get a second one. Um, you can visit a highly designed landscape that's rooted in spectacle. There's nothing wrong with the landscape in this photo, um, but it does perpetuate this notion that you have to go to landscape in order to experience landscape, even though landscape is all around us all the time. Um, you can buy a house and hire a designer. So that's an approach, but increasingly that's becoming very off limits and just like unattainable to a lot of people. We're in California, coastal California at that. The home prices in our neighborhood are completely ridiculous. A house just sold down the street. We're renters, so this has nothing to do with us, but for almost $3 million. So, um, you know, th things are totally out of whack in this regard. And so this is increasingly unattainable for people. And then there's this trend here, um, the native plant trend, which has been great in some ways. It's opened up a whole new world of plants in the nursery trade and plants that we can use as design professionals. Um, but the other problem is that this is also translated into this pervasive belief that you that the only way to create a landscape now is one that's all native plants. And then this has trickled out into government policy, into funding. So I've done projects where they won't fund any plant that's not considered native. Um, and the problem with this is it really sets up a barrier and a set of rules for entry into landscape. And I'm not comfortable with this at all. And there's a lot of research that's been done looking at immigrant communities and um, the, how using native plants as the way to engage people with immigrant communities is really not effective at all. And it sets up a lot of barriers. We think about it, a lot of the plants that resonate with us have to do with things that are deep inside of us that have to do with experience, that have to do with memory. Um, and so if you set up uh, a rigid set of rules like this, you can really prevent people from tapping into those memories and tapping into those experiences in order to engage with landscape. 
Um, and finally, we experience landscapes with our, with our senses. And this is a landscape that I, I've done and I, I'm gonna talk about a little later. So it's a science experiment, and, but I don't want it to read as a, a science experiment. I want it to read first and foremost as something that's gonna stir your senses. And then if you wanna learn more, you can dig deeper. And there's this extra layer, which is actually looking at the real water needs of plants as opposed to the perceived water needs of plants. So I'm gonna pass it off to James. Yes, yeah, so this is the first worship I did in 2007 with a group of uh, at-risk Latina youth uh, that were, or take care of horses to keep them, you know, uh, engaged. So uh, they had just got this lot in Atwater on the LA River, and they wanted and the architect wanted to design a stable for these girls on their horses. So uh, you know, I just took the class at Art Center, and uh, one of my friends was in the board for this nonprofit, and said, "Hey, can you help us get these these you know girls engaged in the design of this horse stable?" So yeah, this was the first project I've done, uh, and uh, it was incredible. You know, uh, we had like 30, 30 girls, and uh, the ED wanted to give the girls horses, but I told her no. You know, I wanted to design with these objects and not the horse. So so half the girls end up having the horse, and the other half uh, didn't. So the ones that had the horse end up decorating the horse. The ones that did not have the horse end up designing these awesome spaces. You know what, this is where the host, this is where I feed the horse, this is where I relax, this is where the horse is, gets clean. So it was, it was more spatial, more imaginative. So, so you just, so really kind of taught me about how do you, how do these objects that were kind of non-representational in, a, you know, in, in kind of designing your ideal stable. But yeah, this is a really good, uh, you know, really good example. What, this is the first workshop we did and uh, it really, it really kind of set the tone for our work, to, you know, and uh, that first kind of, was kind of developed in the art world and then in the nonprofit world. And we find that the, the objects really, uh, you know, break down barriers and they really have people, this is working in New York and, uh, and uh, in Port Chester and uh, at a senior center. I took these objects to a senior center and uh, put them on the table and all these Latina women started playing with them. So I had them build their ideal community for the grandkids and they were so excited about it using their hands and talking about it, they wanted to do more. They wanted me to come back again and again and again. But yeah, but then they told me they do a lot of crafts and this is really important to them. But if I would, if I would approach them with the map, they would have probably walked away from me and not even had all this input. It was really fun. And I think the early workshops really, people built, you really, you really could create empathy between people because you start sharing the stories. This is what you need for the planning process. You know, so yeah. So, and then also we can look at a, uh, difference, you know, like you could have topics such as this is the LGBT works that are people building their uh, first memory being different. And uh, yeah, it was really, it's important for people to, people that have voices or marginalized to start to create their voice and kind of create the collective values through these memories. But to tell people are really powerful because that's kind of your DNA for city planning, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so people build childhood memories and idle spaces. And uh, yeah, so we've been all over the country and people, you know, it's been really positive. A lot of people that don't understand city planning, they understand their memory and tell them this is where the planning project starts and the design project starts and we are articulating their memory. So these, these women were Latina and they were, he designed their street with, uh, with, with, you know, with the vendors, the bike paths and trees, and they be able to articulate that. Before the workshop, they told me, you know, we're, we're not architects, so we can't really do it, but they could do it, you know, and they, they did it. And then they, they participated in creating ideal street. So, so this collaboration kind of happens with objects and spaces so people can really kind of realize that they're stronger together. So yeah, so people end up building, they'll build parking lots for freeways because they are working together and they're thinking about their childhood memory, which is a very nurturing, nurturing environment. So they want to kind of create that nurturing world around them. And then, 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 then after that, what I do is, uh, this is a workshop in Alhambra. <laughs> Anyways, I do uh, have people build their, tell a story about their, their Molly just built. Just tell, pick a day and time and tell us what you're doing in the future and tell us what you're doing in your model. And this way people start to visualize, you know, their future. Let's talk about it. Yeah, so of course the pandemic then happened and we had to really shift gears and we've translated this whole format into an online format. So we do model building workshops with people online and they use 
found objects that they have lying around the house to build um, favorite childhood memories, first memory of a mobility experience, and then we'll have them build their ideal neighborhood, their ideal community. And it's been really effective. I mean, people obviously, as we all know, we're saturated with screen time. So to have that opportunity to work with your hands really changes how you feel internally, but also sparks your creative mind. So you can come up with really interesting solutions to problems in your neighborhood. So the other medium that we have developed along the way is exploring space with our senses. And we do this in a whole bunch of different ways. But the whole idea is to attune your senses to overlook details in everyday spaces. So this is an example of that in these photos here. This is something we do called a weed walkabout, where we go out and we look at all the plants that are growing in sidewalks and document those plants. Um, we're looking at what the stories of these plants are. Um, how are they able, able to survive? Where do they come from? They all come from somewhere. How did they get here? When did they get here? And then when we take all of those and put them together, what does that suggest about the actual ecology of a place? Um, so there is an ecology and part of that ecology also involves the uh, sidewalks and the asphalt and the houses and the street trees. And um, so the idea too is that, you know, this is also nature. So like I was saying earlier, like there's this, there's this tendency to want to say, you know, we have to go to a landscape in order to experience it, but landscape is all around us. And this is one of the ways of exploring it. This is a participant who um, was on one of the weed walkabouts who said, you know, I remember immediately afterwards, my level of awareness of plants that are around me and increased sharply. So it really heightens your senses to the details around you. And then from there, this can actually be a really incredible place to then do some sort of design exploration because your senses are heightened. You're in this sensing state. It's not a sense a state of high alert. It's more of a pleasant a uh, sensing state to be in, and then you can do things that are, we can tap into your creative side. So this is something that grew out of the, the weed walkabouts. This is a landscape that I did in the Presidio, and this is uh, in an abandoned playground actually. So the whole idea was looking at plants that were already growing in the space, framing those and having those be the plants and not planting anything. So the shapes and forms in here actually just frame the pre-existing plant. So what would happen if you created a landscape like this where you just didn't plant anything and let it grow? And then here's a view of it out into the ocean. And then from there, we created a design proposal for a project in Belgium that was for an abandoned industrial site. And we looked at the idea of how you could daylight seed banks that have been dormant underneath the asphalt for years and years and how that could translate into both an ornamental landscape and a landscape for discovery and learning. We've also done these in parking lots. So we'll go take people to a parking lot and have them explore the parking lot with their senses and find a spot in the parking lot that they like to be in. And then from there, we'll go and do a model building exercise where we'll have them transform that space. And again, because they're already in this sensing state, it's very easy to segue into a model building exercise. More recently, we've translated this into a virtual format. So we've been working with Habitat for Humanity in Southern California, and we made a virtual version of the site, uh, sensory-based site exploration. So we had people take videos of themselves and their favorite spots in their neighborhood and talk about why they love those spots. And then we spliced them together into a virtual tour, which we watched online. And then we had people do a model building exercise where they built their ideal neighborhood. And then finally, this is another thing that we've done with landscapes. So this is when I do workshops on irrigation free landscapes. So that's something I'm going to talk about a little bit later, but getting people into a sensing state by way of various photos and asking them directed questions about the environments that they're seeing. What are the cues in here that tell you what this environment is, where it is, and then from there, can we then talk about what the plants are and what their drought adaptations are? So I'm going to hand it over to James to talk about our third medium, the pop-up model. Yes, yeah, so I did, I did pop-up models. These kind of uh, these kind of grow out of my work work as a kid. You build your models, models. So uh, so way to get people to take these to where people are and kind of build these models uh, with together. This is in Mexico, Tijuana. We built a model. We, we built a model for this uh, community center to share their ideas. So uh, 
Yeah, so it's a easy way to get to get people engaged in planning, and this is a and you know it keeps it, it, it helps people see the beauty or see their community at, at a different scale, and at a really you know, tactile scale, but also in a really beautiful scale. What's the beauty of my neighborhood? You know, when you have things that are different colors and shapes and textures versus not this way, and uh, the people get really excited about you know these models, and they, they start to even if it's just kind of a a two, two or three minute interaction to begin to think about, you know, their, their city in a different way. This is working in, 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 part, in Eugene, Oregon, where we're trying to get more Latinos to access parks. So we, did, we built these models and we put it, we take it, we placed it in a, in a, a Mercado in a Eugene and people were just shopping and they would stop and plug this model, maybe even have a two or three minute interaction with this way to get people engaged you know, and looking at the spaces in different ways. So, uh, so so, we were able to kind of do a report on how to get like to use parts more. Yeah, so now we're gonna move on to some of the psychological underpinnings behind all this work. So um, we go back to what I was saying earlier, or James was saying earlier about community engagement and some of the problems we were noticing. Invariably, the medium of engagement with most community engagement is words, language, it's talking or it's writing. Um, and you're really only engaging uh, one part of your brain when you're doing that, uh, loosely speaking, the prefrontal cortex. Um, so this is what regulates um, our emotions, keeps us focused on survival. It's something that we don't have when we're very young. So this is fully formed when we're in our mid twenties. Um, so it helps us survive. So it serves a purpose. Um, but it also keeps us really focused on ourselves and keeps us very selfish. So that is, in a lot of ways, why when we just flat out ask people what they want, they're going <coughs> to default to things like parking, like um, no traffic, because they perceive those as immediate needs and they're also very selfish needs. So essentially we default to what's in front of our noses. So kids can actually, we know this already, but they can um, imagine and play really easily. And part of that just has to do with brain development. The prefrontal cortex isn't fully formed. Um, but for adults, we really need to bypass that. And a way to bypass that um, prefrontal cortex, um, selfish you way of thinking is to work with your hands. And when you work with your hands, you fire up different parts of your brain, you can suddenly be much more expansive in your thinking. And then what you can do is sink into a state of play and you can just create, be creative, imagine, build, and you're not hung up on all these concerns about survival. Uh, you can be aspirational and you can also work with people better. So it's much easier to collaborate when you're working with your hands than it is when you're just talking. And we can also tap into core values. So what I was saying earlier about how we do these model building exercises with people and they have them build their favorite childhood memory, nature invariably comes out on what, with almost all the, the models. And so what we're, we find, we found over the years is that it really is just a core value. And of course there are other core values that come out of this too, family, friends, exploration, connection, um, but they never have to do with things like parking and traffic, um, no density is another one that you hear a lot, typical community meetings, but you never hear that when we do these model building workshops. The thing we run into though, is there's still this pervasive uh, misperception a notion that play is something that's only for kids. Um, it's not something that adults do and also that it's not useful that it can't lead to real changes in your neighborhood, for example. Um, but it actually can and we've found this over and over again with our work that it does. Um, so this is a good segue. So moving into some of the projects that we've done, we're going to profile three projects. So this is a California Avenue bike ped underpass in Palo Alto. What we were trying to do here is figure out some sort of set of creative solutions for this underpass, which had been built in the 60s. It's incredibly narrow. It goes under the Caltrain tracks. It was never conceived of as something for people who say bike to school, bike to work. It was just sort of done as like a, a little service, like, oh, these are for the people who maybe have to bike or walk. But the reality now in Palo Alto is that over 50% of students bike to school. 
So what had been happening is that there had become or developed uh, conflicts with the bicyclists and the pedestrians in the space because it's too narrow. And so um, we ended up setting up a series of workshops, but we did it so that we had one with younger users of the, users of the space and one with older users of the space first, um, because the conflicts had really been between older users of the space saying that the younger users were like biking past them too fast and it made them nervous. And then the younger users were saying that the older people would yell at them and swear at them and tell them to slow down. So we decided to just separate those groups first and do one with the young folks here and then one with older folks. Interesting to point out, uh, so with the one with the older folks, the people who came are actually like the kind of demographic that we've talked about, the typical demographic of people who come to community meetings. Um, and in a very talk based format, they would invariably dominate the discussion. But because we had people work with their hands and build models, and we also had the model building exercises not be about the actual um, California Avenue underpass, we were able to level the playing field and have everyone participate no matter their background. Then on a separate day after we had done that, we brought everyone together to the underpass itself and we did a site um, exploration of the space using our senses and then moved into a model building exercise with groups of people that were intentionally mixed. So older users of the space and younger users of the space. And then what they did is redesigned the actual space. We also started the whole thing by recapping the themes that had come out, come out of the previous workshops, just to show that like, hey, look, we have these values that are shared. So we might see ourselves as adversaries, but we all want the same things at the end of the day. There were no conflicts. Um, people came up with incredibly creative ideas. And as you can see in the photo, like people were really happy by that. We didn't prompt people to smile for this photo. It was just like that this was the mood by the end of the series of engagement events. This is another project that um, we've done. So this is with students in um, high school students in San Francisco. So what we're doing is having them explore job adaptations with their senses. So as I mentioned earlier, I showed this photo. This is an example of one of the irrigation free landscapes that I do. So every plant in this landscape has a number and I monitored how much water the plants got for an entire year because we wanted to look at what the actual water needs of the plants were as opposed to the perceived ones. Um, but you know, this is very technical. And so I want to think like, okay, well, how can I involve everyone in this process? How can everyone become their own irrigation free expert? So these are students here at Abraham Lincoln High School. A lot of them live in multifamily housing. A lot of them have probably never gardened. They've maybe never been in a garden. They've maybe never even touched a plant before. So if that's the starting point, then how do we lead them through a series of exercises to get to the point where they're both curious about all these things, but also feel like, yes, this is something that I could actually do. I could, I could make an irrigation free landscape. So what we tried to do this is through their senses. So I gave a brief, brief overview of drought adaptations and why um, this is all relevant to us now. But then the bulk of the exercise involved dividing the students up into groups. And there were six groups and they each got a plant. And then they used their senses of smell, touch, and sight to deduce the dry adaptations of the plants. I intentionally brought in plants that smell because that's a really great way of just awakening people's senses and um, making this a memorable exercise for them. And so once they had done that for two minutes, then we'd switch the plants and they'd have another one and they'd do the same thing. And then at the end, uh, we would go through and talk about each plant. Okay, what are the dry adaptations? And then they'd all say, okay, it was roots, it was leaves, it was smell. And then we would talk about, okay, so these are the adaptations. Would it work, would this plant work in an unirrigated landscape setting? One of the coolest things about this project is that uh, there was one student who talked a lot and I just figured it was someone who talks all the time, but the teacher um, who runs a really cool program there, you guys should all look her up. She does a, she runs a green architecture program there. She said, no, actually that kid never talks. There was something about this exercise. It just really spoke to him. It sparked his imagination, his curiosity. And 
he loved it and he talked the whole time. So um, I, I, I don't know, so that just shows the power of when we engage through our hands and our senses as opposed to language and what can happen. All right, I'll turn it over to James. Yeah, this is a workshop I done maybe five or six years ago in Phoenix with people with disabilities. Uh, the city had just built this facility, rec recreational facility for people with disabilities, and it's right next to a rail line, but there was no rail stop next to this rail line. So people with disabilities, uh, you know, they take public transportation a lot. So we, we did a we did a model building workshop where I had them all build their ideal station based on their disability. So we could be talking, sight, hearing. So they all built their stations of uh, what that ideal station would look like. And then they, they, they had all these great ideas about what they wanted to see. And they were able to kind of transfer their problem into a solution, you know, their physical problem into a solution, a spatial, spatial solution. So they, be, they became really excited about, you know, uh, their solution. So for five years, they lobbied the city of Phoenix, the mayor and the, and the transportation authority had built a station and now they have a station, you know? So it was a way of getting them to transform their ideas and their struggles into something more permanent and really kind of plant their seed in their head, you know, because they were able to articulate what that looks like and feels like, and they can go to the mayor and say, I want, I want this, I want this, I want this, and it becomes easy. So now they have a really beautiful station that they're all really proud of. This is a way of really transforming people's, you know, thoughts in their heads into something really powerful and negotiable for, for city planning. So, 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 uh, yeah. So, 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 different ideas will come up through the workshops that are physical, or even just getting people to understand how they connect with the built environment. You know, if you're a woman, person of color, what does it feel like to walk down the street, and then how do you articulate that, and how do you make better streets that are more inclusive? Okay, so uh, yes, that's our that's our program. That's our, that's our information. We have a book out coming out in Ireland Press in the in fall of twenty twenty one. So thank you. Questions? Thank you so much for an incredible talk. Um, we'll take any questions from the Zoom Q and A feature. Um, we actually do have a question right now from Yvette. Um, do you have? certain objects, go-to objects that you always bring with you for these workshops, or does it vary with each workshop? Well, I think our objects are, they have to be clean, colorful, have texture and shape and form. We want to jog people's memories about places and experiences. So maybe something yellow will trigger warmth in the sun. Something blue triggers water. You know, or maybe something detailed will, will, will trigger intimacy. We just have a lot of different colors and shapes and uh, to get people thinking and be creative. And I really push your limits, really push your limits of creativity. A lot of times people say, you know, I wanted to build this ocean, but all, all you had were, were blue hair rollers. So I had to use these for the, for the waves, but that's what you want to do. Because when people, people push their imaginations, that's when their minds opened up. So, so use a lot of just a lot of uh, interesting textures that used to be very attracted to. It doesn't have to be expensive. It can be stuff you get at the 99 cent store or stuff around the house. There's stuff people that are, are, they're somewhat familiar with, like hair rollers are really popular because people you view them different ways. And a lot of, you know, women think, well, I can, I'm playing with hair rollers, you know, this is really cool. Yeah, and I think just the importance of not being literal with the objects is really important. So, um, you know, don't use things, well, not, I don't want to say don't, um, but what we found, let's say, is that you know when you use things like actual buildings or people or these things that are very literal, um, it can limit people's imaginations. So it's better in our experience to just use like what James says, just like random objects, colorful. One thing that came to mind is we had a lot of yellow. I think it was fake yellow flowers or something, and that triggered a memory in a participant who was from Ethiopia, and she talked about when she was a kid she would explore these vacant. Uh, fields around where she lived and they were full of yellow flowers. And then from there, she just built that, that memory. So. Thank you. We have a couple more questions. Um, Helen asked, Helen Leah asked, I do a lot of community engagement projects in my classes. Have you ever done workshops like these in an academic led context? Yeah, sometimes I'll do workshops, uh, you know, with, with different you know, schools, you know, different academic, you know, 
uh, departments to urban planning architecture to teach, pe teach people how to do engagement. Because it's, it's one of these processes that it's, it's like learning how to swim. If you, don't, if you don't jump in the water, you're not going to really learn it. So just by doing it once or twice, you get the idea of what your body goes through and what you're going through mentally. So you can start to figure out how to do this yourself and kind of, and the whole idea is to really kind of crap the way people solve problems, you know, based on you know, who you are a designer as a way to kind of figure out how, how this best works for you. You know, just because I think for me, using objects works easily and, uh, and it's quick and it's, it's very nonverbal. So, and I find I'm, I'm comfortable in the kind of space, you know, where, where, where a teacher might be a lot more verbal about this stuff. We've also, just as an example, so we worked with a school in Southern California, Rosewood Elementary. It's actually an urban planning design magnet school. And we trained the teachers in these methods. And the, so model building and also in the site exploration. And then they applied those methods and modif modified them and applied them to their own classrooms. <laughs> And that included like everyone from science teachers to English teachers. So we had an English teacher who developed a model building exercise where she used this basic approach to the found objects. And she had her students build a scene from a novel as they imagined it in their minds. So when we read a book, you know, we have these images in our minds that we create to make sense of what's going on in the novel. Um, you know, what the characters look like, what the spaces look like, and they're all personal and they're all different. So she had them actually take that and translate that into a physical model. Um, and I, I love that story because it shows the real versatility of this method. I mean, this didn't have to do with urban planning, it was English, but you can see how you can apply this to so many different contexts. Yeah, and I think the whole idea is to really capture the intangibles in public spaces, because you know we're not trying to build a building or not, we're not trying to look at brick and mortar, we're trying to think about these emotions and feelings that people bring into a space. It's hard to articulate, you know, but, I, but, but, but for, for you personally, that's really important, it's important to you. But there's not a lot of tools to translate these kind of intuitive feelings you have in this kind of public discourse. You know, you can't do it with a dot and a map, but maybe a yellow flower will, will represent something that makes you feel good in that space. Thank you. We have um, more questions coming in. Um, Alexis Kellner asked, what are the ways you condense and translate these models and workshops into plans and proposals for the future of the spaces? Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, so um, it's, I'm trying to think of like, what are, what if there's like a mystical, magical process involved in that. I think part of it is that, you know, what we're gonna do is take themes um, feelings, specific ideas to and translate them into designs and drawings. But I think backing up from there, the method is able to pull out a lot of these intangibles that James said, but also things that might not arise from a normal engagement process. So um, in South Colton, which is a, a small neighborhood, Latino neighborhood in Southern California, and we a lot of the book that's coming out on Island Press is about this year-long project we did there engaging them in active transportation. Um, but because we use these methods, one of the things that emerged and that became a part of the plans, the designs, and the drawings was these very DIY ways in which the residents were enhancing their public realm in the ways that were meaningful to them. So um, play, playground equipment in parkways, one person had put these um, kind of arches over the sidewalk and decorated them with these with tinsel and different Christmas things. It was almost like an arcade that you could walk through. These are the kinds of things that in a typical planning process would either be ignored or they, the planning department code enforcement would say that these are in violation of planning code. Um, but through these methods, we were able to bring these out as real assets of this community and make them a part of the plan. So the street sections, um, and you can go on our website and, and look at this actual document and see some of these drawings, but like the street sections that I ultimately created had very, I mean, I think to a lot of design professionals, especially more conventional ones, the kind of wacky things in them, like basketball hoops that were in the parkway, but like facing the street, so that like the street becomes a basketball court. Um, benches, um, fountains in the front yards, like all sorts of things that really 
would normally be not allowed, but we said like these are the ways that the residents really beautify and make meaning within this environment. Yeah, so. also, I also think that, uh, uh, you know, like, I think as a lot of urban planners, you know, they kind of don't like Smith it because it's not very direct. Like they want you to say, like for instance, in Alhambra, they're doing a zone up, 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 upgrade, and they're asking people, do you want the door in front of the building or the side of the building? You know, it's just like, so, but if, so you're going to get the same crap with the door on the side of the front. It's not very interesting. It's not very much about thinking about feeling or emotion or what you really want. So I think this way, people can talk about things through metaphors. You know, they'll, they'll give you like an idea, like, you know, I want, I, want, I want to see more puppy dogs or more koala bears or pandas down Fifth Avenue in New York City. But what does that mean? What are they trying to say? I want to see more intimate, kind of cozy Fifth Avenue. But this gives, this gives people a way to talk about, you know, their environment in this, in this, in this different method. Because sometimes they don't have the word to say that, but they'll just say, well, these are metaphors. So I think for us, you know, we've done so many workshops, you know, so many times, you see the same patterns over and over again. You know, I think, uh, you know, like for instance, a lot of, you know, a lot of you know, women will talk about space as emotion. You know, there's garden, it's a feeling, it's an emotion. It's how I feel about a space. And that's critical for them. And, you know, that has to have value and you have to be able to really to articulate, give them tools to articulate that. So, so, it's, so it's how do you really translate these kind of metaphors people use to get a better picture of what people really want, not just focus on the infrastructure. Yeah, and then I think it's also a question of not being super literal. So like what James is saying with, you know, the animals on Fifth Avenue, you're really capturing a feeling. So for our participants, we found like they really want to feel like they've been heard in the process. They, they don't want to think like, okay, well, like they listen to me. They want to feel like they've been heard. So if they can see the essence of those ideas in the final design, then that's what's gonna, gonna resonate with them. And so what we're ultimately doing is kind of pulling out what people feel as opposed to perhaps what they think. So when we engage people through talking, a lot of times it's like what you think, but when you build and use your hands, what really comes out is what you feel about a place and a space. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the big distrust between planners and the community because the two community members, they feel their spaces. The client wants to know that space, which is zoned for, how much it costs, and the very different ways of looking at a space. You either feel it or you know it. But this is a way to get people to, the plan, this is a way to get the planners to understand how places feel for their community, not just, not just knowing it through a map. Awesome. And uh, we have a question from Vanessa Dikuyama. Sorry if I pronounced your name incorrectly. Um, thank you for your great presentation. Have you had the same level of success with these forms of engagement with all demographics? Or have you found that specific age groups, ethnicities, socioeconomic backgrounds resp respond better to this methodology? Well, I think, uh, you know, you know, it's really, you know, I think most of our clients are women uh, around the country. So I think that demographic really needs a way to express themselves in, in a certain way. And uh, in Latinos and, you know, every different, everybody, but I think our hardest demographic to deal with are kind of the older males because they see the city as a competition, uh, you know, and, and they see talking as being their tool. So, and, it, and, 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 and collaboration, it's for them with a weakness. So, so, so we'll do workshops, we'll have like five men at a table and we'll stare at each other. Thinking, you know, you know, I can't do this, you know, we have, you know, cause I'm not, I'm not winning this game. So it's just, a, so that's kind of the hardest demographic to work with. You know, they're just, they, cause they, they already have all their ideas and they, it, they're, they're, the, they're the information tower. And it's like, you know, I have the answer. You, you have to listen to me and follow me. But I, they tell people it's about collaboration. If you can't collaborate, you can't plan, but but everybody else is good at collaborating. You'll see this difference, you know. But I also think, you know, like in the case of Palo Alto, so we had the, with the demographic that James is talking about, we had them participating. So we did get them to participate. It just took a little bit of more of like coaxing to, to lead them into it. I mean, um, you know, in older people's defense, I mean, in, in like I, we're all part of this. We're not used to playing 
I mean, that's not what adults are used to doing. So it can feel very strange. It can feel very odd. It can be like, why are we doing this? Um, so sometimes there is just a little bit of coaxing that has to happen. And the other thing too, is that sometimes it's really helpful to have a couple of people who are respected in the neighborhood, in the community, who are on board before we do the actual workshops. So they can be like, okay, look guys, to their folks, to their community, we're gonna be doing something different here. And it's gonna be fun. Um, it might be a little strange at first, but like this is gonna be a really awesome process and we're gonna generate some really cool ideas from this. So that's a way to give people a heads up beforehand. And then the leaders of a community can communicate that to the people they work with in a way that they'll understand. Yeah, and also, one of the biggest uh, benefits is that these workshops are about relationship building. So if you want to hear about, if you want to, you know, some people, some people are curious about other people, and some people aren't. So, so a lot of people, a lot of times, people see this as a tool to build relationships between, you know, other people and the built environment, and you know, and, and that's critical for long-term sustainability of a community. You know, because people have to live together. For you know, for a period of time, they have to build that relationship. This is really how nurture that relationship. In fact, sometimes we would do these for happy hours for people to get together just to get, get to know each other, because that's a really critical part of I, I feel the planning process is really getting people to get to know each other, understand each other, build their empathy so they can kind of move on together. Awesome. I think we have time for one or two more questions before the next um, panel happens. Um, Aubrey Bader asked, thank you all for this en enlivening presentation for landscape architecture students interested in learning more about this process of community engagement and planning. What resources are most helpful? Mm. <laughs> Well, I could give a cheap plug for our book that's coming out <laughs> so you guys can read that. I, did, I do think that will be helpful. Um, of course, I'm biased, but it is building off of all the work we've done for the past 10, 15 years and really grounding it in psychology, but also interviewing people. We've interviewed a ton of people who've been through this process to learn about their perspectives and how it's worked for them. Um, what comes to your mind, though, other than that? Is well, it good? well, I think you know, each individual can do this themselves. You know, it's a way to exploring who you are. And I think that's kind of the first step of, you know, this whole process is really getting people to think about, you know, they're reflecting on their childhoods and doing this activity and then learning about yourself first by doing it and then spreading, spreading it to others. You know, it's, it's not, you know, it's all about you and your connection, then like I made this connection. Now I could do it with my other other friend, make that connection. So a lot of it's really kind of based on the individual that wants to go out there and do this. You know, it's not like you know, I can, you know, because everybody has emotions and feelings, and you know, but it's just I think as designers, it's how can we we we're, we're probably a bit more articulate about what these things are, and we see these patterns out there in the community, and, and it's really fun to engage you know, people you know in this activity to kind of understand that kind of pattern language. So I would just start with their, your small cohort of friends. And I was also thinking too, you know, just as a design student, try this activity as like an initial stage of exploration in a design, design project. So assemble some found objects together. You just use a, you know, use a book as a base or construction paper and just build a model. Like, don't worry about perfect scale. Don't worry about all the things that were taught in design school that are super important. And you know, eventually when you get into construction documents and stuff, of course they have to be uh, perfect in scale, but start with that kind of messy process and, and see how it goes for you. And then like James is saying, you could do it with friends as well. You know, just like invite some friends together and do this as a happy hour. So. <coughs> Um, I had a personal question. So have you had students, um, recent graduates or any sort of like volunteers or interns kind of like join your workshops or see how these methods are being carried out in the past? Um, yeah, so I'm just, I'm curious to see like the team, like what kind of team is leading it? Is it just you two or, you know, ha have students been involved? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think it's uh, basically us two. It's just more of a method. And people have been involved. Sometimes, like, you know, when I used to work in, live in LA, I would do installations at the museums. You know, at the Natural History Museum, and you and I would ask people to come help me or, you know, go, go to the workshop and just come um, help facilitate. So I think people, so it's really easy way to get people just engaged and, you know, people just learn from this, from these kind of small interactions. But uh, yeah, it's not, it's not like this, you know, we're, we're not building construction drawings and just kind of getting people to kind of say, almost like having a party or something, you know, it's just kind of how do you, how do you set up for the party and make this phenomenon happen? We've also, um, Lisa, with our work with Habitat for Humanity and doing these workshops online, like we've trained folks with Habitat to lead their own breakout rooms and do these model building exercises. So, and we've done that, you know, with students where they'll help us out with the workshop because the process is pretty intuitive and it's it's pretty simple. Um, it's something that people can pick up really easily and then they can help out. And more recently, like I'm doing a lot more with film and video and trying to involve people in all of this through film and video. So like there's a, a I wouldn't say an intern, but like a student who reached out to me and like she's gonna be kind of shadowing me as I'm like filming. We're doing a film for Safe Routes to School or the National Safe Routes Partnership. So, so yeah, I mean, there are ways of tapping in. Um, but it's all, it usually, generally, it's just James and me for a two person show. So. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Anna, so we have time for one last question before we end the session today. Um, Anna asked, uh, thanks for the presentation. How do you promote your workshops and invite people to attend? Uh, we have about four minutes left. Thank you. Okay, well, it's, it's, all, it's all been by word of mouth for the past uh, you know, 10 years. People see it. And people get it or they don't get it. They see it and they like it. It's so visual, so rich. People just attracted to it. So it's usually just word of mouth. And uh, you know, that's, how we, that's how it's been promoted. You know, we don't really go out there promoting it. And people, yeah, they, they like it. Um, you know, there are a couple of things of just to add to that in terms of promotion. Like if we're doing a project that's engaging a neighborhood or community, it really helps to have someone who's kind of embedded in the neighborhood, a leader, and they can really help promote a workshop, especially the one that we want people to attend. Um, and then I think the visual nature of the work as well really lends itself uh, really well to visual uh, materials that we'll use to promote the, the different events. Uh, but yeah, I think having that person in the community, if you're doing something that's on a neighborhood level is really important. Because uh, you can just, you can access, they just have so much more access to um, all that social capital and the things that you really need to, to promote these kinds of events. Yeah. Yeah, I think also because this is such an interdisciplinary process, you could do it as an artist, standing on the street, standing on the street corner, or you could do it as, a, as an education tool. It has a lot of different applications. So, you know, I do a lot, I do a lot of libraries you know, or art with art galleries. So it has a lot of different applications. You can kind of find your way to find your way in, so it has a really big audience. Thank you so much for that incredible talk. Um, we'll end right here. Uh, thank you again, James and John, for joining us today, and uh, thank you everyone for attending. Um, enjoy the rest of the conference. Enjoy Labash. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks for coming. See you in Alhambra. <laughs> See you in Alhambra. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Funny, huh? Yeah.